Welcome everyone to mm -hmm. Foresight Inspired Tech and Health Extension Group, sponsored by 100 Plus Capital. I am really delighted to have Tony Whiskeray here today from Stanford University to discuss Young Blood for Old Grains. This was a nomination from Sunny Arison, who is chairing this group uh, and um, um, whose uh, company 100 Plus is sponsoring this group. And uh, she makes really wonderful suggestions. She holds your work really, really highly, Tony. So thanks a lot for joining us today. She's extremely excited about your work. Uh, and, and I think so are many of the people here already on this call. Um, I will keep my intro extremely brief to give you as much time as possible. We'll also hear a little bit from Neil Lipman, who just joined. Uh, afterwards, we'll be helping me a little bit during the uh, moderated Q&A. Uh, but apart from that, uh, I think just reiterating my usual algorithm uh, that uh, get in your questions early through the chat. That way we make sure that they get answered. Otherwise, we take hand raises for afterwards. Um, okay, uh, without further ado, thanks a ton for joining and taking time for discussing um, um, young blood for old and brains with our group. And uh, the stage is yours, Tony. Great, thank you, Alison. Can you see the slides? Yep. In uh, slide mode. Great. Okay. Uh, thanks so much for for having me. Um, uh, first, a disclosure. Um, I will talk a little bit about uh, work at the end that we spun out in a new company called Teal. Um, but I thought I will give you sort of a general overview what the lab is interested in, what 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 I'm personally interested in, and uh, where we came from, uh, how we got started in in this field. Um, the sequence is not exactly how the experiments always worked, but um, the thinking behind this is, I think, how we uh, came uh, to where we are now. So we're interested in how the brain with age becomes susceptible to cognitive dysfunction, neurodegeneration, and diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. And um, as you know, um, Alzheimer's disease, for example, is uh, their, their genetic forms, but age is really the key driver uh, of this. And uh, this is illustrated here. If you look in people around um, 65 to 70 years of age, there may be 3% or so estimated to have dementia. Um, in people above 85, that rises to up to a third um, with dementia or cognitive, severe cognitive impairment. And if you look in 100-year-old people, um, you get 55% uh, or so with frank dementia, then another 15% who are clearly cognitively impaired. Um, so, you know, very, very dark outlook uh, for, for getting old. And I think most people, if you ask them, what is your biggest fear of, you know, getting old, um, are concerned about their brains. What's also very interesting, though, is that 30% reach age uh, 100 years or older, and they have no appreciable cognitive impairment. I mean, they're slower. They don't think as fast. They have maybe word finding problems a little bit, but by all means, if you do a standard um, cognitive test with them, they perform, you know, like a 60 year old, 70 year old person. Um, so that means we have the DNA as humans to have a functional brain for at least 100 years. Now, not many of us reach this, but um, it suggests it's possible to have this resilience. And so we can try to understand what makes these people reach this age with the cognition, cognition intact and not just ask who has the risk to get disease. We can look who is protected from it. Um, now, when you look sort of um, uh, at, at the functional readouts um, uh, of how the brain ages, you see that most domains uh, really decline starting at age 50 or so. Uh, perceptual speed uh, decreases actually from very young age. Um, but the other ones, some of them are flat. Um, verbal ability even increases to some extent as you get older. But then uh, really they all start to go uh, down with age. And you see this also when you do a number of different imaging studies. Uh, there is a, a loss of brain volume. The brain actually shrinks um, uh, and there is loss of cells and, and uh, also 
uh, of white matter, which connects uh, neurons, um, sort of the signaling between the cells. Now, we don't actually have an understanding of how the brain ages at a molecular level. Um, so most of it is really function and structure that we know about human brain aging. And this is because it has been very difficult to get access to the brain. The brain is, of course, not the only organ that ages and becomes susceptible to disease. This graph here shows that as people get older, they have multiple age-related disorders. Um, it's estimated that at age 65, people have on average two or more conditions. But really the challenge is how do we study aging? And I think um, we don't really have what we often call a natural history of aging, like we have from, from many diseases, uh, because the tools were not available to do this at scale. Um, but now increasingly with tools allowing us to look at every molecule or almost every molecule, um, uh, we can do these, uh, what often are referred to as omics approaches, where we look at changes at the DNA called epigenetics, proteins, transcripts, lipids, metabolites, and really look at scale at them. Now, you usually have to do that by extracting cells or looking at fluids, and it has been challenging to do this in particular for the brain, because um, the brain obviously is not accessible um, directly uh, in living people. And so most of what we know, again, at the molecular level is from people who died. But one possibility is to potentially study the brain in, in the blood. And this sounds a bit funny, but if you think of, uh, about the blood, it connects all the tissues in our body. Um, it uh, transports, of course, cells, as red blood cells, white blood cells to all these different tissues. But it, calls, it, it contains also this liquid, which we call plasma, that contains thousands of different molecules uh, that we can potentially measure. And you could argue that uh, these molecules can potentially come from any uh, different tissue um, and that the body actually uses the blood to communicate between tissues. And so again, the blood, if you look at its composition, it has um, blood cells. And then the liquid fraction is called plasma and it contains all these different molecules that in clinical medicine, we have actually taken advantage. We measure specific proteins, but they're typically linked to a specific disease uh, or we measure lipids to look, you know, cholesterol levels, where, whether you're at risk for heart disease and so forth. Um, and um, so blood tests have, have really been used to record organ function and mostly pathology in standard clinical chemistry and medicine. But what we argue is that we could potentially use that also to study the brain and actually to get information, much more information about the physiological state of the brain, but many, maybe also of many other tissues. And so we, we use then the blood um, as a medium to understand how the organism changes uh, with age uh, in response to exercise, in response to diet and pathology as people have traditionally done, but really use the blood sort of as a medium to gain molecular information about the physiological state of the body. And we've uh, started to do this probably 15 years ago now um, and um, this is sort of a culmination of, of one of the largest studies we've done and published in 2019. Benoit Lehalier was actually the lead author of this uh, study. And, and here we had, um, in collaboration with Nir Barcelona and Sophia Milman of Einstein College and Adam Butterworth at the Interval Study, we had access to over 4,000 uh, blood samples from uh, healthy uh, people who had you know, some age-related uh, changes but by all means were, were sort of healthy, um, age 20 to almost 100. And across these two studies, we were able to measure 3,000 proteins roughly um, uh, with a platform from the company Somalogic. So these are sort of modified oligonucleotides that allow you to specifically detect the levels of thousands of proteins. They have now 7,000, they will soon have 10,000 proteins they can measure. Um, uh, with, with this platform. And if you do this, um, you see, first of all, you see dramatic 
changes in levels of proteins with sex. Um, some of them are hormonal, many of them are not. Uh, you see dramatic changes with age. Um, some proteins going up, some going down uh, in, in this large study. And uh, if you visualize sort of the age-related changes uh, with, with color here in blue, a relatively low level of a protein, in yellow, high levels of a protein, you see these dramatic changes that happen with, uh, across human lifespan. Now, this is cross-sectional. So we look at these 4,300 people, um, and they're just uh, aligned here from youngest to oldest people. And then for each person, we have these 3,000 measurements of proteins, right? And so what you see is young people have a very different composition of the blood than old people. The changes are not linear. Um, and you see, you know, large numbers of proteins that are low when you're young, they increase when you're old, uh, but they also see the opposite. And then you see other uh, types of changes. In fact, um, let me just go to this here. If you actually look at sort of the tra trajectories of changes, you can uh, extract proteins that show similar patterns of change that um, show, for example, this exponential change with age. And then you can put them together in so-called clusters and you can ask, what are these proteins? Are they related in their function? And that's what we see surprisingly. So we have clusters of sometimes just a few proteins that show a very similar trajectory. Um, and what's interesting is uh, many of these changes are in sort of extracellular matrix, um, um, heparin, glucosaminoglycan, um, but also axon guidance, efferin signaling and so forth. Let me go back here. So if you look at the changes that happen with age and you ask at any particular age, group, for example, if you look at age 40, how many proteins are significantly higher or lower between younger people and older people? And so you can ask that at any age, you basically count the number of proteins that are significantly different between younger and older people. And we use an interval of five years or 10 years to, to make that calculation. And then you, you sum these up and you get sort of these what we call waves of aging. And again, what this basically means is this is the number of proteins that change. And I, I don't have the, the, the scale here, but these are about roughly 300 proteins that are significantly different at age 35 from people who are um, five years younger compared to those who are five years older. And so we slide this um, scale across the human lifespan. We see these waves of aging. And this is a particularly interesting way because it's not appreciated so much that there are these, you know, prominent changes with age already at a very young, um, uh, very young age. And maybe this is linked to evolution because from an evolutionary perspective, after you reproduce and sort of your offspring is guaranteed and independent, uh, evolution, evolutionary pressure subsides and you would not have uh, additional pressure for the organism to live longer. And so maybe this is what is reflected here. This is actually not a sex specific uh, change. Some of these are uh, linked to menopause in women, but um, men show a very similar peak. Um, and you actually see it also with different uh, tools, not just with proteins, as I'll show in a minute. Another wave at around age 60, this is linked actually to heart disease in particular. And then the most dramatic wave when most people sort of study aging and look at, um, at you know, age-related changes and age-related diseases, here really everything starts to change. Um, and you can ask, what are the proteins, the top proteins that change here significantly? And you see some proteins um, show up in every wave, like GDF15, and that's because it increases linearly. So at every age, Younger people will always have a lower level of GDF15 than older people. But then you see proteins that show up really significantly only in one wave and not in another one. And so um, we have still not been able to address and, and study what this exactly means, but there's a lot of potential uh, information here, I think, 
and uh, we definitely want to push uh, this approach uh, further. Um, as I mentioned, it you see these waves actually, not just if you look at the plasma proteome. This is a study from Marcus et al. Um, they looked at these DNA changes, the epigenetic changes in blood cells. And uh, this is split here by females and males. And they looked uh, across lifespan also in 172 individuals, age 20 to 90, sort of similar um, uh, time uh, or um, uh, age range. And uh, what they see with, with this uh, technique called a taxi, that there are epigenetic changes that again are most prominent, uh, make sort of waves of, of changes one prominent um, at around 40 years of age, so very similar to what we see, and then another one around 65 or so. Um, maybe the st statistical power wasn't there to see really this large wave uh, at age 80. But um, again, this suggests that aging, and we know this now from many different studies and model organism, age really starts uh, at a very early uh, time but there are these sort of waves that we uh, can try to understand. And um, observing these changes with age across multiple diseases has um, made a lot of people uh, wonder and, and start to question whether we should tackle age-related diseases by um, targeting the aging process itself rather than just one disease at a time. And this, I think it's something that also is gaining traction to treat neurodegenerative diseases where more and more people start to realize age is really the key driver and we should try to understand how age makes the brain susceptible and slowing down or reversing this aging process has become one way to tackling these diseases and this is often referred to as a rejuvenation and um, while rejuvenation was really a, a, sort of a crazy thought and I think a pipe dream just 10, 15 years ago, um, it has become more and more a reality in, at least in um, modern studies with, with mice, for example, as I list here. Um, and so there are now multiple types of interventions, uh, such as metabolic interventions, caloric restriction, exercise, small molecules, the removal of senescent cells, or transient epigenetic reprogramming, where you use the same factors that allow you to make an induced pluripotent stem cell to just um, basically push um, uh, aged cells back to a slightly younger state by erasing some of these epigenetic marks. Or then this treatment with uh, young blood or young spinal fluid, as I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Um, so multiple interventions that suggest, at least in mice, that we can slow down the aging process or even reverse it. And um, so again, my lab came from the observation that with age, you have these dramatic changes in the blood. And I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, actually be recruited to Stanford by Tom Rando, um, uh, who, and who also had his lab next to me, who used this mod called parabiosis. Um, now, um, almost yeah, 17 years ago already, um, together with Irina, my convoy uh, published a study where he could show that muscle stem cell aging can be slowed down or reversed with this model called parabiosis. So in this model, you basically connect surgically uh, two mice of, of different ages, a young mouse and an old mouse uh, together. And because these are genetically identical. They don't reject each other. Um, and blood vessels actually grow into the surgical view, wound and fuse. And so you have now a so-called anastomosis that allows exchange of blood from the young mouse to the old and vice versa. And so again, if you think of what I showed you before, the composition of the blood changes with age. And so what this model allows you to do is to ask, what happens to an old organism if I um, let now young blood um, get into that organism? And what happens to the young if it gets exposed to old blood, um, to these um, different mole molecules that we can uh, find? And again, Tom uh, was able to show that circulatory factors 
could um, rejuvenate um, the old stem cell in the muscle and make it function almost like a young one. He also observed similar effects in the liver and um, he uh, described that there was increased proliferation of cells in the brain, but didn't really follow up on that. And this is where our collaboration started. And we were then able to show uh, with Saul Vileda when he was a graduate student in my lab. He has now his own lab at UCSF that um, you, you can apply this to the brain as well. And I'll show you a little bit more on that. Uh, but in the meantime, many other labs uh, were able to um, replicate these findings and show effects on, on many different organs as well. Um, what you can also um, uh, do, and I think Saul was actually the first to do this uh, systematically, is you can uh, simply just infuse uh, plasma, the liquid again, from, uh, from young animals into old and vice versa. And so, again, this is a summary of a lot of work uh, from people in my lab, um, that, where we could show that if you collect um, young plasma from, so called plasma collected from young mice, you infuse it repeatedly into old mice, you can increase stem cell activity, synaptic plasticity, you can reduce inflammation, and you can improve memory function in these old mice, and vice versa if you uh, take old plasma and put it into young mice, you get the opposite effects. And the same thing happens with, uh, with parabiosis, but with parabiosis, it's difficult to uh, study uh, memory function. Uh, I should say, though, I, I don't think I have this slide in here. Um, uh, Vadim Gladyshev has actually shown uh, that if you um, do the parabiosis for a few weeks and then you um, surgically disconnect the mice again um, and, and let them live for, for two or three months, you can do cognitive testing and there's actually a long lasting effect. And he also observes multiple positive uh, effects um, on, uh, on at the molecular level, at the cellular level, suggesting that some of these effects last uh, for, for a significant amount of time. And, um, and uh, it can be mediated by these factors in the blood. Because this was so, is so translational and blood gets perfused or plasma gets perfused into people all the time, um, we started a company, Alcahest. Initially, we worked with uh, Stanford um, uh, to uh, do a, cl a small clinical trial where we treated uh, Alzheimer's patients with uh, plasma donations that were matched by blood group, but then uh, we started to work with Griffles, who's one of the large, large companies who collect plasma and make all these different products uh, out of plasma, such as antibodies, um, IgG fractions, um, albumin, and, and so forth. And, and there, uh, in these pools of uh, plasma, you don't actually have to match uh, by blood type anymore. And so in small proof of concept clinical trials, we were able to show that this is safe. Um, and we had promising result in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And at the same time, Griffles also ran a, a much larger double um, uh, uh, placebo controlled trial with 500 patients with uh, Alzheimer's disease. And they could show if they remove plasma in a process called apheresis in patients first, and then give them a fraction of plasma that is rich in albumin or contains, you know, 95% albumin, but still a lot of other proteins, um, they have uh, actually observed um, slowing of disease progression, improvement in memory and daily functioning, suggesting that some of these effects we see in animals, in mice, might actually apply to humans. And so there's now discussions how to um, move this forward in, into the clinic as a um, as a treatment and uh, what a, a, an additional phase three, a larger phase three trial should look like. So, but the question is, how does this all work? Um, how does young blood actually rejuvenate? What are the factors? Where do they come from? Which cell types does young blood rejuvenate? Um, how do the factors reach the brain if we talk specifically about um, effects on the brain? And then broader questions, how do cells and organs age and um, how we actually measure aging? Because 
if you ever want to have a treatment that targets the aging process, of course, you have to be able to measure it. Um, and we need tools that measure the age of a specific tissue. If you want to treat a disease related to liver aging, then you have to be able to measure the age of the liver. Otherwise you don't know what your drug is, is doing. And so I, I want to end by this. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, we spun this actually out some of these findings into a new company called Teal. And this is work by graduate students, Hamilton O and Jared Rutledge, who are also co-founders of Teal. Um, and here the idea is really, again, this concept that the proteins in the blood are derived from different tissues. And while many proteins are produced in cells and organs across the body, some of them are made only, for example, in the brain. And so can we measure these proteins and does that tell us something about brain function? So this is the concept that we applied here. Again, we, we use the somologic platform. In this uh, study, we had uh, almost 5,000 proteins. And so for each of these proteins, we ask, where is this protein expressed? And for this, we use uh, gene expression maps. Um, and this is not absolutely perfect. And we use sort of an enrichment score rather than an absolute score. But we find that roughly 15% of these proteins can be assigned to a given tissue. So we find about 200 proteins in the blood that are most likely derived from the brain and so forth, 150 or so liver specific proteins. And uh, what we can do with these, we can again, because many of them change with age, we can try to model age uh, in what is often called um, clocks, estimators of, of tissue age. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this. So we have the actual age of a person uh, using um, linear modeling, uh, regression modeling, um, and number uh, measurements from many, many people, you can uh, try to model uh, chronological age. And then for each person you get sort of, either you get a perfect um, estimation of their actual age, or more often you get a deviation from this perfect age, which would be this line here. And a person may be younger, their age, um, their actual chronological age or older, and this is called delta age or the age gap. And so people have done that, and this was really pioneered by Steve Horvath, based on changes in the, in the um, modification of DNA, these epigenetic changes. Uh, he has uh, pioneered this building of epigenetic clocks. And um, the epigenetic clocks are mostly measured on blood cells because in living people, you can't get access to tissues. Um, but what we want to do instead, we want to look at these proteins that are derived from a given tissue and get information about biological age and physiological state. And this is what we did in this study. Um, uh, so we have healthy people that we use, uh, where we use all proteins to get at organismal age. So the overall age of the body, or then these uh, proteins that are derived from heart, kidney, brain, and so forth. And then uh, we uh, test them in independent cohorts. Um, and we have actually now uh, almost 6,000 samples that we use for this and a much larger training set and a much larger testing set as well. But this is what uh, we, uh, we had at, at this point here. Um, so he, uh, just as an example, the heart aging model. So again, you have the actual age of a person here and then based on specific proteins that we believe are derived from the heart, we make a prediction of how old the heart is. And for each person, we can then say their heart is relatively younger than the average population, or it's relatively older. Now we're not aiming to get a perfect prediction like many in the field are doing. I think that makes no sense whatsoever because we, we know how old a person is. We really are interested what the, the, the deviation from the actual chronological age are, is. So this regression value here um, 
is really hard to judge is this a good value or a bad value because in the end we want to know whether this is linked to function and so um just briefly the proteins we actually have only eight proteins in this hard clock um and this is just um sort of one of the experiments that we can do this is from plasma of individuals that was collected here at time zero and then we have 15 year follow-up from these individuals so this is a true longitudinal study and we see that people who are predicted to have younger hearts who are in the bottom quartile here they show basically a very low or no incidence of heart failure and heart disease whereas those in the top quartile who are predicted to have older hearts they have a 15-fold increased risk to develop uh, heart failure over 15 years and similarly for the brain uh, again we we have uh, brain specific proteins um, if we look at the bottom quartile people with predicted young brains compared to those with old brains in our Stanford Alzheimer's disease cohort. Those who have Alzheimer's disease tend to have older brains. And um, again, in longitudinal follow-up here, we have only five years blood collected at time zero. Those with young brains um, tend to have memory intact five years later. And those with older brains have a seven-fold increased risk to show a decline in cognitive function. We also find uh, when you look globally at the whole body map in patients with Alzheimer's disease, they have older brains, but they also tend to have older hearts and some other tissues are older compared to the average population. And you can actually do that for other types of diseases. People with um, hypertension, for example, they have older kidneys. People with heart disease, as I showed you before, they clearly have older hearts, but they also have some other tissues older. And so um, this is just sort of a beginning of, I think, a new approach that we want to take to gain information in living people on the age, not just the age, the biological age, but also on the physiological state of their tissues with new biological information. Um, and obviously these proteins that we measure here are potentially also interesting as uh, drug targets in the future. With that, I would like to acknowledge lots of collaborators and uh, people in the lab who have contributed to this uh, work and then uh, uh, funding from multiple uh, sources. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much. This was uh, like a host of information, uh, really concisely uh, packed. Um, and really glad to see that there's now a company uh, around this too. So congratulations on that. Uh, it's very exciting Thank to you. see. Um, very cool. Okay, we, we will have a ton of questions, I'm sure. I will take, I will start with the chat. Mia, yeah, I see your hand. We will come to you. Uh, I, um, the moment that I have the question from Lou covered, um, and then we'll be going back and forth um, between the chat and hand raised questions. Uh, Lou, if you can unmute, uh, you can ask your first question now, and we'll leave some chat at the end for Neil to jump in. But for now, um, let's get as many questions uh, going as you possibly can manage uh, in, in this time. Great. Um, so, my question is, um, I've read the Convoy's latest studies done with Dobry Kiproff. Well, th first of all, thank you. That was a great lecture and I really appreciate you. your science and also your presentation was fantastic. Your graphics are beautiful too. Um, so I've uh, read your work and I've also been very interested to track the Convoy's latest studies with Dobry Kiproff, who's a TPE expert. And it's re very interesting to see how the benefits of TPE, where you're just swapping out old plasma and replacing it with saline plus albumin, replicates many of the benefits of heterochronic parabiosis. So I'd like to get your thoughts on what you think about those studies and also the unique advantages of using young plasma rather than just dilution. Yeah, that's a great question. Really appreciate it. It's, um, I think Irina and Mike have a really interesting paradigm with this with this plasma exchange model. Um, I have to I, I I think albumin itself is a is a is a very um, interesting protein, and there are clearly studies that show that the capacity. So albumin is like a sponge; it's a carrier of a lot of growth factors, and um, with age, 
uh, it gets modified and is not as potent in its function anymore. And there are actually companies who just try to make recombinant albumin and use it for that. Interestingly, Griffoles, uh, that plasma company, came with that approach to, to, uh, to their studies. Um, but they also remove plasma and then they give, an al they give albumin. Now, the thing is, when you buy albumin, you buy 99% pure. And that albumin is purified. You cannot purify albumin to 100% purity. Unless you re use recombinant protein, that fraction, it's called fraction 5, that is very rich in growth factors because that's what albumin is doing. So when, when people remove anything and then they infuse plasma, uh, infuse albumin, they infuse a growth factor cocktail. Um, this is the same in cell culture where people, you know, sometimes erroneously, they say, I, I just added albumin, but they did not just add albumin. They added um, a cocktail of growth factors and growth factors are incredibly potent. So even if you have, you know, a fraction of a fraction of a percent, that's still enough to have a beneficial effect. So I think that's one point. But the, the other point is really that I think um, what, what the convoys are doing is they remove some of the old factors, and that's probably a very good thing. So I think, um, you know, there is something to removing old plasma and maybe even just giving a, a saline solution back will be better than keeping some of the detrimental old factors. So I think we will see how this translates and it will be interesting to see uh, clinical studies uh, potentially going that way. Wonderful. We have Abdul Kader. You had three questions. Maybe stick to one and we'll get to the others for the next time. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, um, I think uh, uh, my uh, first question, uh, just uh, for now, I, I mean, as a, as a scientist, I'm interested to know whether experimental animals mirror this uh, wave uh, uh, phenomenon that we observe in humans. So was that actually detected or studied in animals? That would be, I think, my most important. Yeah, the, the waves of aging, great question. We tried to do this. The, the problem is you need large numbers of samples, right? So you need most, most animal studies are limited. They have, you know, 10, 20, 30 animals. You cannot get that resolution. But we had a study where we had about 100 mice and we definitely see similar changes. That was a transcriptional study. So we, we, we have now a study under, um, uh, with, with Jackson Labs in collaboration with 1,000 mice. And so hopefully that will give us um, the, the necessary resolution to get more insight into that. Thank you. Cool. Nir. Uh, Tony, thanks for another lecture, for your leadership. For your hey, Nir. Good to see you. <laughs> yes. So, so uh, you know, just for everybody to know, the, the reason I'm so excited is not, not only because of what you heard, but because for every gerotherapeutics, the proteomic is much more likely to change more rapidly than, for example, methylation, okay? And be more meaningful than other things. So I think, I think proteomic is really important. And, and I think that th this breakdown that you talked about, the, the extracellular me metrics, and we have the granulation of tissues and stuff, mm -hmm. is really a good marker because that's what you, we want to stop. No matter how we treat, we want to stop the breakdown of aging. So my question really is, um, you know, be, beyond the age of 60, we notice that females have only third of the proteome difference. You know, they're, they're very, we call it very stable proteome. It sounds from what you said that that's not the, the case in 40 years old. Um, you know, I, I wonder if you, you thought about the differences. Um. What do you mean? It it at you said at forty years you see more differences or no? You said you said something that there's no mm -hmm. much sex difference. There's a huge sex difference between sixty five and ninety five. There oh, I, I got it. Yeah, sorry, maybe maybe I I misspoke there. So you you see sex dependent differences um, throughout lifespan, 
um, and they're very prominent. Um, but at the same time, the waves of aging are not just caused by um, due to sex. So because some people th may think, oh, you know, that wave there is probably menopause in women, right? But men also have that wave. So it's not just a hormonal sex dependent wave of change. But overall, if you look at any age, there are differences between men and women. Yeah. But yeah. by the way, we described in our cohort that men over the age of 88 develop men in the menopause. You know, you don't know that because mo most men yeah. die much yeah. before. But we have a lot of centenarians. And, oh, that's and interesting. So, so we would pick it up in the proteome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and, and thank you for, for your comment. I, I think the, the proteome is so rich and the platforms are getting better and better, um, you know, with, with uh, the possibility to reliably measure, you know, almost 10,000 proteins now. You get so much biological information. And of course, you can add the lipidome and you can add metabolome, but these are all biological signals that come from some cell, from some tissue, and we should use it. The epigenome is super exciting if you have a mouse and you can grind up every tissue you want. But for humans, it has very limited use because it measures only, you know, in the cells that you can obtain and you have no other information on other tissues. Very good point. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, we're getting more hands, not less Cosmo, you know. <laughs> Uh, I've been interested in some time uh, about the the uh, molecular mechanisms of Alzheimer's disease, and since the the top genetic candidate for predicting it is APOE, which is a lipoprotein, I'm wondering if there's been any attempt to specifically categorize the proteome of all the lipoproteins floating around. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, there's people. So if you look at a protein. Uh, we typically look only at one form of a protein, but many proteins actually come in a lot of proteoforms. That's probably what you're getting at. Um, there are companies that, that use mass spectrometry um, um, to look at multiple different proteoforms in cancer, for example. Carolyn Bertosi here started a company that is doing that. And ju just as an example, they find, I think, a dozen different versions of transferrin and so I'm sure if you start looking at lipoproteins such as APOE, you will find a lot of variants that, again, may give you additional information about disease susceptibility, progression, or resilience. That's a great idea. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, thank you very much for a great talk. Um, my question is also about the waves. So those waves are very drastic. They, they're huge waves, and they definitely describe um, periods of life where there's fast changes. Um, but those are huge protein changes. They're, they're, they're very significant. And the brain itself is a very small organ. So whatever protein is a, a causal protein for, for, for aging, it will get diluted in the blood a lot. So we would expect that the marker that has causality effects should be a very, very small concentration. And how this can be tracked in populational studies? Yeah, that's a great point. Now, I have to say the brain consumes 20% of the energy uh, of the body and, and you know, that is, is most highly vascularized tissue, a larger organ. So there is probably much more, um, you know, a much larger portion than its relative weight, um, in, you know, of, of molecules that are brain derived. But, um, I think we're not just looking for causal proteins, but we're looking for signatures of change, um, that report, um, you know, what's going on. Um, and then it's possible that, um, factors that promote aging of the brain are, are, you know, in, present in much higher concentrations, uh, but the brain is susceptible to these changes in a lot of genetic diseases. Um, even though the genes are expressed in many different tissues, the brain is always the first to show, um, you know, a, a disease phenotype. So it's not necessary that, um, 
you know, even if a protein is highly abundant and you can readily detect it, um, that could only cause disease in the brain. We just don't know it yet, right? And other cells, other tissues are resilient to that effect. So I think it's hard to predict just based on, you know, weight of the tissue and abundance of a protein, what cause and effect might look like. And I also Arena? maybe just a, another comment too. So the, the, the measurements we show are just, you know, they're, they're all normalized data and they don't necessarily speak to, you know, how many fold a factor change. In fact, most proteins don't change by twofold. It's just, you know, 20%, 30%. And it's, it's hard to put a mark on what that means biologically. So you really have to look at each protein individually, what that means. Wonderful. Uh, we have maybe Marina, and then I think uh, we're almost running out of time because we want to get some time also for Neil. Yeah, thank you, Alison, and thank you, Tony, for the great talk. Um, I have a question about the um, proteins, which would be markers of the brain tissue. So you mentioned that there are a lot of them, but I, I didn't really work with, with hundreds of proteins, but all of the biomarkers of the brain they were also expressed in other tissues. So I'm really interested about the specificity. And then another comment, which I have given to you some time ago, uh, with regard to serum versus plasma. So platelets, they do accumulate tons of uh, brain proteins, brain biomarkers, especially growth factors. And sometimes the difference between plasma concentration and serum concentration is 100 fold or 200 fold. So I would be really interested, uh, like, to see um, maybe serum would be better for brain biomarkers? Yeah, th thanks, thanks for this question. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the question serum versus plasma is more in what can you obtain in a reliable fashion? The, the, the coagulation process is a bit unpredictable and leads to activation of the immune cells that you have in the blood. So. Once the coagulation cascade starts, then, you know, the macrophages in the blood and all these other immune cells get activated and they release tons of factors that may lead to a cocktail that has more therapeutic potential, because as you said, you release also all the growth factors from the platelets. So serum may ha have utility as a treatment, but as a diagnostic tool, um, it's very hard to control. And again, you, you have these proteins to a certain extent coming from all the different immune cell of a person. Whereas in the plasma, you just block basically that release and you get quickly rid of all the cells so that you have only what's there in liquid form. Yeah. What, what was your first point again? Um, the specificity to brain cells. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it, you know, many of the proteins are synaptic proteins. Um, I mean, the brain is so highly specialized in its function, right? It has so many um, uh, highly uh, specialized cellular processes that, um, you know, it's, it's not surprising that the brain is sort of the highest of the uh, specificity in, in, uh, in our list of tissues. Um, yeah, I, I think we're, we're, we're recording to some extent synaptic uh, protein um, turnover or where these proteins come from, how they end up in the blood is, of course, another question. Thank you. Cool. Um, Cosmo, I think you lowered your hand again. I wonder if that was a follow-up question. I just wanted oh. here before, but... Yeah, yeah only, if give you to only if there's Rebecca. no one else, I, I just... Um... Uh, the, the thought that I had about the, the, the waves of aging, is it, is it possible that there's like a dropout effect because people are dying of heart disease and then all of their protein biomarkers are fading? So you see like a peak and then the third peak is dementia. Yeah, I, I, I think that's to some extent possible. The second, although, you know, heart disease, luckily, it doesn't kill as many people anymore. Um, but we, when we look sort of what the proteins are and the top peak in these, and we, we look at the genetics of these uh, proteins or genes, 
then they're linked to heart disease, for example, in the second wave. So we think there is some relationship there between what we measure in these peaks and the susceptibility to disease. Cool. So um, before we hand it over to you, I want to ask a few questions that we always ask uh, folks uh, in this group. One of them is, you know, someone is now entering the space and is pretty young and new, uh, but, you know, extremely excited. Um, is there a particular challenge that you'd like them to, to see solved and that you'd like to see solved that, you know, we could point uh, either individual folks to that are perhaps newer or even potential funders? Like what's something that would make your life much easier or like generally the life uh, of, yeah. um, of folks in your area? Yeah, I mean, there are, of course, a lot of scientific questions that are super interesting, I mean, you know, just these waves or, you know, what, how does the process of age uh, look like if you, um, if you look at trajectories of aging um, and where, where do the, where are these inflection points and what they, do they mean biologically? I think that's super interesting and finding as one of the, the people ask finding models of that in, 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 uh, in animal models, right? So that, that these waves that we seem to see in humans can be modeled, um, and studied. Um, I think sort of a, a larger question, um, or, or wish would be, um, that we get better at data sharing. I think, um, it's become, um, a, a big challenge to. Uh, access data to share data and to make people aware of data that are out there because we're generating with all these new omics tools we we generate such massive amounts of data sets that even people who want to share them um you know find that people don't know that they exist or that they are out there and then there's a lot of barriers where people do not want to share their data um so i think we our knowledge could grow tremendously if we were able to to share the information that has been generated our wow, data sharing is the number one that always comes up and we still haven't around it something for a different group to solve before we hand it over to neil i just want to sneak in um if people are in particular excited about your work uh, what could they do to support you that's like a shameless plug moment of like you know is there anything coming down the line that you want people to be aware of um you mean financially or it can be anything yeah, yeah. it's often financially yeah yeah, yeah I, I i think i mean we you know i can pluck teal you know we're trying to um you know move the company forward and and get it to a stage where we can start you know realizing the potential of measuring age of tissues but we have also a lot of questions, of course, in, in the academic space of, you know, the, the molecular aspects of how, uh, the brain ages and, and how we can study that. And, you know, in, in terms of support, I'd love to study large human cohorts that are out there that have been collected and we haven't been able to find the money to, you know, do plasma proteomics, lipidomics, and really gain that information that we that that would be out there and we just need to measure it we have been near and i have been talking about this for for many time uh, for a, lo a long time and um, we're sort of struggling to get just you know the the cohorts that he has collected and that other people have collected to get them characterized with the tools that are available cool that's concrete enough with that, thank you so, so much from everyone here. Uh, this was a really, really wonderful discussion. Thanks a lot for joining us. Um, and I would love to hand it over to Neil to uh, perhaps close with a few words uh, on like um, pretty relevant related matters. So, Neil, <laughs> no, that's great, great, great segue. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Tony. That was a really great presentation. I really enjoyed it. We've been following your work for a while. Um, let, let me just give 30 seconds uh, background on, on BioVerge, and I can tell you why this is all relevant to this discussion. So. Uh, Bioverge is a financial technology platform democratizing access to enable more individual investors to diversify your portfolio with uh, private high growth healthcare investments. Uh, we've been investing since 2016. We've built a portfolio of 34 companies over that time, uh, spanning the intersection of health and technology, uh, and more specifically, what has become known as, as tech bio uh, companies. 
Uh, we are very interested in and have made several investments in the longevity space or in companies that are tackling age-related diseases, uh, including repair biotechnologies. I'm sure many of you on this call are familiar with, uh, with Reason, who's the CEO. We've invested in Aspen Neuroscience and Occam's Razor, which are both, both uh, tackling Parkinson's disease, for example. Uh, I cannot say anything about specific investment opportunities on this call, uh, but I can say that as part of our diligence process, we utilize a, a network of subject matter experts and others with deep domain expertise to help us evaluate the underlying science and technology for companies that we are looking to invest in. So uh, we're also currently experimenting with an AI-based crowdsourced diligence model. And so what I can say, if there is anyone on this call who is interested and um, would like to be part of our diligence process with respect to Teal, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Love to get you involved in our process and you know have you take a look at the underlying science and, and what Teal is doing. So with that, uh, yeah, th thank you very much. And Tony, really appreciate the, uh, the presentation. That was great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. We already had a question in the chat on um, Teal. It's T-E-A-L. Is that correct? Just to That's get right. a flag. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, cool. I mean, if you do have a website, that would be wonderful to share. Uh, and Neil, I have someone who was requesting your contact information in the chat. If you do want to share that, feel free to do so. Otherwise, I usually say direct all inquiries to me, and I will then ask yeah. for double opt-ins to relevant mm -hmm. people. Um, yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Is there anything we should have asked that we didn't get to in the final minute? Not that I can take of. Good discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so, so much for joining. I hope it wasn't the last time uh, that we talk in this. Uh, lots of, like, yeah, just really quite mind boggling, uh, I think, discoveries that, uh, that are underway. So, thank you so, so much. Thanks, everyone, for thank joining. You. I hope to see many of you at Vision Weekend in San Francisco at next Friday to Sunday, where we have a really big, long biotech track with Reason and uh, with Sonia and uh, with lots of others in this group. So, I hope to see you in person very soon. And uh, if not, we have a virtual holiday gathering with not only the biotech group, but also molecular machines, newer technologies, based technologies and computing on December 15, which you should get an invite to momentarily. With that, thank you so, so much for joining today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you again, Tony. Uh, I hope it wasn't the last time and I'll see you all very soon. Thank you. Bye.